The Spell of the Yosemite from Time and Change by John Burroughs. Yosemite won my heart at once, as it seems to win the hearts of all who visit it. In my case, many things helped to do it, but I am sure a robin, the first I had seen since leaving home, did his part. He struck the right note. He brought the scene home to me. He supplied the link of association. There he was, running over the grass or perching on the fence or singing from a treetop in the old familiar way. Where the robin is at home, there at home am I. But many other things helped to win my heart to the Yosemite. The whole character of the scene, not only its beauty and solemnity, but the air of peace and protection and of home-like seclusion that pervades it. The charm of a nook, a retreat, combined with the power and grandeur of nature in her sternest moods. After passing from the hotel at El Portal, along the foaming and roaring Merced River, and amid the tumbled confusion of enormous granite boulders shaken down from the cliffs above, you cross the threshold of a great valley, as into some vast house or hall carved out of the mountains and at once feel the spell of the brooding calm and sheltered seclusion that pervades it. You pass suddenly from the tumultuous, the chaotic, into the ordered, the tranquil, the restful, which seems enhanced by the power and grandeur that encompass them about. You can hardly be prepared for the hush that suddenly falls upon the river, and for the gentle, rural, and sylvan character of much that surrounds you. The peace of the fields, the seclusion of the woods, the privacy of sunny glades, the enchantment of falls and lucid waters, with a touch of human occupancy here and there, all this set in that enormous granite frame, three or four thousand feet high, ornamented with domes and spires and peaks still higher. It is all this that wins your heart and fills your imagination in the Yosemite. As you ride or walk along the winding road up the level valley amid the noble pines and spruces and oaks, and past the groves and bits of meadow and the camps of many tents and the huge mossy granite boulders here and there reposing in the shade of the trees, with the full, clear, silent river winding through the plain near you, you are all the time aware of the huge vertical walls, their faces scarred and niched, streaked with color or glistening with moisture, and animated with waterfalls rising up on either hand thousands of feet high, not architectural or like something builded, but like the sides and the four corners of the globe itself. What an impression of mass and of power and of grandeur in repose filters into you as you walk along. El Capitan stands there showing its simple sweeping lines through the trees as you approach like one of the veritable pillars of the firmament. How long we are nearing it and passing it. It is so colossal that it seems near while it is yet far off. It is so simple that the eye takes in its naked grandeur at a glance. It demands of you a new standard of size which you cannot at once produce. It is as clean and smooth as the flank of a horse, and as poised and calm as a Greek statue. It curves out toward the base as if planted there to resist the pressure of worlds, probably the most majestic single granite column or mountain buttress on the earth. Its summit is over 3,000 feet above you. Across the valley, nearly, nearly opposite, rise the cathedral rocks to nearly the same height, while farther along, beyond El Capitan, the three brothers shoulder the sky at about the same dizzy height. Near the head of the great valley, North Dome, perfect in outline as if turned in a lathe, and its brother, the Half Dome, or shall we say Half Brother, across the valley, look down upon Mirror Lake from, the alti from an altitude of, more, of over 4,000 feet. These domes suggest enormous granite bubbles, if such were possible, pushed up from below and retaining their forms through the vast geologic ages. Of course they must have weathered enormously, but as the rock seems to peel off in concentric sheets, their forms are preserved. 
One warm, bright Sunday, near the end of April, six of us walked up from the hotel to Vernal and Nevada Falls, or as near to them as we could get, and took our fill of the tumult of foaming waters struggling with the wreck of huge granite cliffs. So impressive and immobile the rock, so impetuous and reckless and determined the onset of the waters till the falls are reached, when the obstructed river seems to find the escape and freedom it was so eagerly seeking. Better to be, to be completely changed into foam and spray by one single leap of six hundred feet into empty space, the river seems to say, than be forever baffled and tortured and torn on this rack of merciless boulders. We followed the zigzagging trail up the steep side of the valley, touching melting snow banks in its upper courses, passing huge granite rocks along meltings, also melting in the snow, slow heat of the geologic ages, pausing to take in the rugged, shaggy spruces and pines that sentineled the mountainsides here and there, or resting our eyes upon Liberty Cap, which carries its suggestive form a thousand or more above the Nevada a thousand feet or more above the Nevada Fall. What beauty, what grandeur attended us that day, the wild tumult of waters, the snow-white falls, the motionless avalanches of granite rocks, and the naked granite shaft liberty cap dominating all. And that night, too, when we sat around a big campfire, near our tents in the valley, and saw the full moon come up and look down upon us from behind Sentinel Rock, and heard the intermittent booming of Yosemite Falls sifting through the spruce trees that towered around us, and felt the tender, brooding spirit of the great valley itself touched to the lyric intensity of the grandeurs on every hand steal in upon us, and possess our souls. Surely that was a night none, uh, none of us ever can forget. As Yosemite can stand the broad, searching light of midday and not be cheapened, so its enchantments can stand the light of the moon and the stars and not be rendered too vague and impalpable. Going from the Grand Canyon to Yosemite is going from one sublimity to another of a different order. The canyon is the more strange, unearthly, apocryphal appeals more to the imagination, and is the more overwhelming in its size, its wealth of color, and its multitude of suggestive forms. But for quiet majesty and beauty, with a touch of the sylvan and pastoral too, Yosemite stands alone. One could live with Yosemite, camp in it, tramp in it, winter and summer in it, and find nature in her tender human, and tender and human, almost domestic moods, as well as in her grand and austere. But it not but I do not think one could ever feel at home in or near the Grand Canyon. It is too unlike anything we ever known, have ever known upon the earth. It is like a vision of some strange colossal city uncovered from the depth of geologic time. You may have come to it, as we did, from the petrified forest where you saw the solidified trunks of thousands of gigantic trees or tree ferns that grew millions of years ago, most of them uncovered, but many of them protruding from the banks of clay and gravel, and in their interiors rich in all the colors of the rainbow. And you wonder if you may not now be gazing upon some petrified, antediluvian city of temples and holy places exhumed by mysterious hands and opened up to the vulgar gaze of today. You look into it from above, and from another world you descend into it at your peril. Yosemite, you enter as into a gigantic hall and make your own. The canyon you gaze down upon and are an alien whether you enter it or not. Yosemite is carved out of the most majestic and enduring of all rocks, granite. The Grand Canyon is carved out of the one, one of the most beautiful but perishable red carboniferous sandstone and limestone. There is a maze of beautiful and intricate lines in the latter, a wilderness of temple-like forms and monumental remains and noble architectural profiles that delight while they bewilder the eyes. Yosemite has much greater simplicity and is much nearer the classic standard of beauty. Its grand and austere features predominate. Of course, but underneath these and adorning them are many touches of the idyllic and the picturesque. Its many waterfalls fluttering like wild lace, white lace, 
against its vertical granite walls, its smooth level floor, its noble pines and oaks, its open glades, its sheltering groves, its bright clear winding river, its soft voice of many waters, its flowers, its birds, its grass, its verdure, even its orchards of blooming apple trees, all enclosed in this tremendous granite frame. What an unforgettable picture it all makes, what a blending of the sublime and the homelike and familiar it, it all is. It is the waterfalls that make the granite alive and bursting into bloom, as it were. What a touch they give! How they enliven the scene! What music they evoke from these harps of stone! The first leap of Yosemite Falls is 1,600 feet. 1,600 feet of a compact mass of snowy rockets shooting downward and bursting into spray around which rainbows flit and hover. The next leap is 400 feet and the last 600. We tried to get near the foot and inspect the hidden recess in which this airy spirit again took on a more tangible form of still running water, but the spray over a large area fell like a summer shower, drenching the trees and the rocks and holding the inquisitive tourist off at a safe distance. We had to beat a retreat with dripping garments before we got within 50 yards at the foot of the fall. At first I was surprised at the volume of water that came hurrying out of the hidden recess of dripping rocks and trees, a swiftly flowing stream thirty or forty feet wide and four or five feet deep. How could that comparatively narrow curtain of white spray up there give birth to such a full, robust stream? But I saw that in making the tremendous leap from the top of the precipice the stream was suddenly drawn out as we stretch a rubber band in our hands and that the solid and massive current below was like the rubber again relaxed. The strain was over and the united waters deepened and slowed up over the rocky bed. Yosemite for a home or a camp, the Grand Canyon for a spectacle. I have spoken of the robin I saw in Yosemite Valley. Think how forlorn, forlorn and out of place a robin would seem in the Grand Canyon. What would he do there? There is no turf for him to inspect. There are no trees for him to perch on. I should as soon as expect to find him amid the pyramids of Egypt or amid the ruins of Karnak. The bluebird was in the Yosemite also. And the water oozel haunted the lucid waters. I noticed the peculiarity of the oak in the Yosemite that I never saw elsewhere. Footnote. I have since observed the same trait in the oaks in Georgia, probably a characteristic of this tree in southern latitudes. A fluid or outflowing condition of the growth above ground, such as one usually sees in the roots of trees, so that it tended to envelop and swallow, as it were, any solid object which it, with which it came in contact. If its trunk touched a point of rock, it would put out great, great oaken lips several inches in extent, as if to draw the rock into its maw. If a dry limb was cut or broken off a foot from the trunk, these thin oaken lips would slowly creep out and envelop it, a sort of western omnivorous trait appearing in the trees. Whitman refers to the slumbering and liquid trees. These Yosemite oaks recall his expression more surely than, of, than any of our eastern trees. The reader may create for himself a good image of Yosemite by thinking of a section of seven or eight miles of the Hudson River midway of its course and emptied of its water and deepened 3,000 feet or more, having the sides nearly vertical with snow-white waterfalls fluttering against them. Here and there the famous spires and domes planted along the rim and the landscape of groves and glades with its still clear winding river occupying the body, the bottom. One cannot look upon Yosemite or walk beneath its towering walls without the question arising in his mind, how did all this happen? What were the agents that brought it about? There has been a great geologic drama enacted here. Who or what were the star actors? There are two other valleys in this part of the Sierra, Hetch Hetchy and Kings River, that are almost identical in their main features, though the Merced Yosemite is the widest of the three. Each of them is a tremendous chasm in the granite rock which nearly, with nearly vertical walls, domes, El Capitans, and sentinel and cathedral rocks and waterfalls, all modeled on the same general plan. I believe there is nothing just like this trio of Yosemites anywhere else on the globe. 
Guided by one's ordinary sense of judgment alone, one's judgment as developed and disciplined by the everyday affairs of life and the everyday course of nature, one would say, on beholding Yosemite, here is the work of exceptional and extraordinary agents or world-building forces. It is as surprising and exceptional as would be a cathedral in a village street or a gigantic sequoia in a grove of our balsam firs. The approach to it up the Merced River does not prepare one for any such astonishing spectacle as awaits one. The rushing, foaming water amid the tumbled confusion of huge granite rocks in the open V-shaped valley are nothing very remarkable or unusual. Then suddenly you are on the threshold of, the, of this hall of the elder gods. Demons and furies might lurk in the valley below, but here is the abode of the serene, beneficent Olympian deities. All is so calm, so hushed, so friendly, yet so towering, so stupendous, so unspeakably beautiful. You are in a mansion carved out of the granite foundations of the earth with walls two or three thousand feet high, hung here and there with snow-white waterfalls, and the supporting, and supporting the blue sky on domes and pinnacles still higher. Oh, the calmness and majesty of the scene, the evidence of such tremendous activity of some force, some agent, and now so tranquil, so sheltering, so beneficent. That there should be two or three Yosemites in the Sierra, not very far apart, all with the main features singularly alike, is very significant as if this kind of valley was latent in the granite of that region, some peculiarity of rock structure that lends itself readily to these formations. The Sierra lies beyond the southern limit of the great continental ice sheet of late tertiary times, but it nursed and reared many local glaciers, and to the eroding power of these its Yosemites are partly due. But water was at work here long before the ice eating down into the granite and laying up open the mountain for the ice to begin its work. Ice may come and ice may go, since says the river, but I go on forever. Water tends to make a V-shaped valley, ice a U-shaped one. Though in the Hawaiian Islands, where water erosion alone has taken place, the prevailing form of the valleys is that of the U-shaped. Yosemite approximates, approximates this to this shape, and ice has certainly played a part in its formation, but the glacier seems to have stopped at the outlet of the great valley. It did not travel beyond the gigantic hall. It helped to excavate. The valley of the Merced from the mouth of the Yosemite downward is an open valley strewn with huge angular granite rocks and shows no signs of glaciation, whatever. The reason of this abruptness is quite beyond my ken. It is to me a plausible theory that when the granite that formed the Sierra was lifted or squeezed up by the shrinking of the earth, large fissures and crevices may have occurred in that Yosemite, and kindred valleys may be the result of the action of water and ice in enlarging these original chasms. Little wonder that the earlier geologists such as Whitney were led to, the, to attri attribute the exceptional character of these valleys to the exceptional and extraordinary agents to sudden faulting or dislocation of the earth's crust be it, but geologists are becoming more and more loath to call in the cataclysmic cata, cataclysmal to explain any feature of the topography of the land not to the thunder or to the lightning to earthquake or to volcano to the forces of upheaval or discoloration but to the still small voice of the rain and the winds or the frost and the snow, the gentle forces now and here active all about us, carving the valleys and reducing the mountains, and changing the courses of rivers. To these, as Lyle taught us, we are to look in nine cases out of ten, yes, in ninety-nine out of a hundred, to account for the configuration of the continents. The geologists of our day, while not agreeing as to the amount of work done respectively by ice and water, yet agree that to the latter the large proportion of the excavation is to be ascribed. At any rate, beyond them both they have turned out one of the most beautiful and stupendous pieces of mountain carving to be found upon the earth.